morning. Good morning. That was feeble. But all the noise came from this side of the room. And uh, it's an unusual. Normally this is the barren side. It's loaded. I'm a little confused myself. All right, first announcements. We have arrived at our Christmas day. Uh, Saturday, December 24th, we're going to have a Christmas Eve service here. You should come for that at 7 p.m. Kind of nice. It only takes an hour. Uh, on the 25th, we're going to have a 10.30 a.m. Christmas worship service as, as usual. So I imagine we'll really be loaded up that day. And uh, January 3rd, Tuesday, is the at 6.30 p.m. is the next prayer meeting. And then January 9th at 6.30 p.m. Monday, the board will meet. And somebody call me this time and let me know because I tend to forget. It's weird that even though I make the announcement 24 hours prior, I still, I, I don't know. Anyway, uh, Sunday, January 29th, during worship, the annual board meeting will take place and we will vote on a budget and all those good things. And uh, you should be here for that because even if you're not a member, you are still part of this congregation and how what we do things here kind of affects you too. Uh, and actually, we very much hope that it affects you in a way that's very positive for your relationship with God. So, that being said, please walk across the aisle, say hello to someone you haven't talked to yet this morning, and uh, tell them you love
Okay, you're turning 13? All right. for an assassin. After all the background checks, interviews, and testing were done, there were three finalists, two men and a woman. For the final test, the CIA took, it, took the CIA agents took one of the men to a large metal door, handed him a gun. We must know that you will follow our instructions no matter what the circumstances. Inside this room, you will find your wife sitting in a, sitting in a chair. Kill her. The man said, you can't be serious. I could never shoot my wife. The agent said, then you're not the right man for the job. Take your wife and go home. The second man was given the same instructions, and he took the gun and went to the room. All was quiet for about five minutes, and then the man came out with tears in his eyes. I tried, but I can't kill my wife. The agent said, you do not have what it takes. Take your wife and go. Finally, it was the woman's turn. She, she, gave, she was given the same instructions to kill her husband. She took the gun and went to the room. Shots were heard, one shot after another. Then heard, they heard screaming, crashing, banging on the walls, and after a few minutes, all was quiet. The door opened slowly, and there stood the woman. She wiped the sweat from her brow. The gun was loaded with blanks, she said. I had to beat him to death with the chair. <laughs> three Baptists and three Methodists are traveling by train to a conference. At the station, the three, the, three, the three Methodists each buy tickets and watch as the three Baptists buy only one. How are three people going to travel on only one ticket, asked the, the first Methodist. Watch and you'll see, said one of the Baptists. They all board the train and the, the Methodists take their respective seats, but all three Baptists cram into a bathroom and close the door behind them. Shortly after the train has departed, the conductor comes around collecting tickets. He knocks on the bathroom door and says, Ticket, please. The door opens just a crack, and a single arm emerges with the ticket. The conductor takes it and moves on. The Irishman, or the, the Methodists, see this and agree. It was quite a clever idea. So after the conference, the Methodists decide to copy the Scot, copy the Baptist, and they return trip to save some money, being clever with money and all that. When they get to the train station, they buy a single ticket for the return trip. To their astonishments, the Baptists don't buy a ticket at all. How are you going to travel without a ticket, says one perplexed, perplexed Methodist. Watch and you'll see, answers the Baptist. When they board the train, the three Methodists cram into the bathroom, and the Baptists cram into another one nearby. The train departs shortly afterwards. One of the Baptists leaves the bathroom, walks over to the bathroom where the Irishmen are hiding, and knocks on the door and says, ticket please. <laughs> Come on, if you have to think about that really hard, that's bad. <laughs> that's, that's funny. That's funny. All right. It's our Christmas day. We got a lot of kids up here that are waiting to, waiting to do their thing. I'm sure Dad has a lot to say after all that food while we sleep. So I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Who is doing the lighting today? This would be Kayla and the kids. All right. All the kids? Yeah. Yeah, why not? And they're so excited. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. We've been negligent. Jesus shows us God's perfect love. This is what love is like. Love is patient, love is kind, and it envies no one. Love is never boastful or conceited, rude or selfish. Love is not quick to take offense. It keeps no records of wrong. It does not gloat over other people's troubles, <clears throat> but rejoices in the right, the good, and the true. 
There is nothing that love cannot face. Why are you laughing? There is no light to its faith. No limit to its faith, to its hope, to its endurance. Love never ends. We light the candle of love to remind us that Jesus brings us God's love and shows us how to love others. Love is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at this candle, we, we celebrate the love we find in Jesus Christ. patient with all them kids around, man. I'll tell you what, that's a lot of children. All right, now it's time for you to stand up and worship God, and so you're going to stand and sing. Oh, I'm, I lied to you this time. You guys got the bullet in front of you. Why aren't you all telling me what's going on? We don't even get to sing? All right, well. Well, there you go. Yes, I know it's a man's name, and we angels are always male in the Bible, but you humans always think of us as women. So as not to confuse you, we usually appear that way in your Christmas pageants. God uses many different types to be his messengers, but the important thing is the message. You wouldn't actually have seen me at the manger, but I was there all right. In fact, I was there when it all started, when this baby's life was just beginning. Can you imagine my excitement when God called me to his throne and told me his errand? We'd been watching and waiting for ever so long as he carefully, patiently worked out his way of salvation, and now it was time. I didn't waste a moment, but went straight to Mary at Nazareth, and oh, what a beauty she was. You'll see for yourself in a minute when we add her face to our scene. But the best thing was her spirit, so trusting, willing, accepting, even when I shocked her with the news of how the Savior would come. She'd be pregnant without being married. That really worried her because she's a good girl and it would look so bad for her and her family and Joseph. I'll never forget her last words. I'll do it. Let it be as you say. Such a lovely child, for she really wasn't more than one. Her face was so expressive of awe and wonder when I came, then joy and excitement as she sang her song of praise to her cousin Elizabeth, then patiently enduring before the vicious slander of the village gossips for those long months but you judge for yourself. Here's Mary, the mother of the Savior. I really think they made too much of me. I didn't do more than any devout Jewish girl would have. We'd been oppressed and burdened for so long that we all wanted the Messiah to come. 
and any one of us would have done anything, just anything, to help it happen. But who would ever guess it would be this way? I was absolutely horrified at first. Why? The village gossip would be simply impossible. My family would be disgraced and poor. Sweet Joseph, my husband-to-be, would be so embarrassed. That was my first reaction. But then, when Gabriel told me I was part of God's plan for salvation, what could I say? Of course I was willing. And oh, what delight I felt as the Savior grew to turn within me. I knew I was privileged, little insignificant me, to share in this coming. It was worth the shame. See what I mean? How perfect to see her face at the manger. But of course, it took another beautiful person, Joseph. What a solid, wholesome, gentle, kindly, working man's face he had. He had shoulders of steel and hard calloused hands from a life of work with a crude saw and plane and chisel. Carpentry was hard manual labor in those days. Well, his shock was perhaps even worse than Mary's because at first he didn't know. In her pregnancy before their marriage, well, it could only mean, but let him tell about it himself. Come on in, Joseph. Was I ever glad that you came? <clears throat> Glad you came to see me in a dream. I was in a real panic over Mary. After all, I loved her dearly, yet here she was, pregnant. I knew what the gossip would be, that we hadn't been able to wait for marriage, even though that just wasn't done in good Jewish homes in those days. Well, I knew this wasn't, wasn't true. We were both devout believers and would never have disobeyed. But the horror of it all was imagining what had happened. Had Mary been attacked by one of those rough Roman soldiers and was too ashamed to tell me? Or was there someone else she loved? Maybe she had tired of me because I was so much older than she. Maybe she had found a younger man. What to do? I finally decided not to make a big scene of it, and I quickly broke off her engagement. I didn't want to because I still loved her, but there just wasn't any other way. And then you came. And suddenly it all made sense. We didn't care about the public shame now because both of us knew she carried Jesus, the Savior, as you'd said in the dream. So we were married quietly, talk or no talk, and lived together like brother and sister until after her baby was born. Oh, we were so excited. Imagine our baby, the Savior. Yes, there's another beautiful person to add to our faces around the manger. Joseph had true manly courage to ignore the village talk and marry her, all because he believed too. Oh, they had a rugged time of it at the end, wandering around Bethlehem with her contractions coming ever more closely together and no place to go. But finally, they were given this cave behind the inn. Here's the innkeeper's wife. Let's let her tell about it. Believe me, it wasn't that we didn't want them. We just didn't have even part of a room left. Everything was jammed because of the census. They all had to come, after all, and we'd put double or triple the number in each room already. But I am a woman and have had children, and I could see that this young girl was due any minute. And she was so afraid and lonely, far from home, and her mother, who would or ordinarily have helped her with the birth. Then suddenly, I thought of the cave behind our inn. It's a rough place where our guests keep their animals, with some of ours. It wasn't much, but I took them there and hurried to get hot water and clothes for the bird. At the time, I had no idea who they were, but oh, now I've heard from the shepherds. I've come back again and again to stand amazed at this baby, who's to be the savior. And well, even though the cave wasn't much, I'm so glad we helped them. And maybe it's all the more wonderful that you took them in before you knew that the baby to be born was the Messiah. Welcome to our living picture. Add your loving and hospitable face to those around the manger. You know, it was no accident that Jesus' birth took place in a stable cave. 
It was part of that great, careful, amazing plan of God's that we angels have known about for so long. Jesus was born in a humble stable, so you'd all know he was for everyone. Look who's here already, a simple village girl from a poor home, a rough, rugged carpenter, a modest, caring innkeeper's wife. Add the shepherds now, and you will see what I mean. Oh, we were scared at first. Anyone would be seeing that sky full of light and all the angels of heaven singing. Scared, yes, but excited, too, because you'd already told us the good news. Imagine, good news, the Savior has come. We'd waited so long and wandered together each night when it would happen. Surely the oppression of God's people had to end sometime. Our eagerness for the new King and Savior grew stronger all the time. So now finally, the time had come. We left the sheep with one of our boys, and the dogs, of course, and rushed off through the fields to Bethlehem. We asked everywhere about a baby born in a stable. We soon found him, so tiny, so sweet, right there in the hay where our sheep might have been. And we looked in, looked on in wonder, could, that, could it be that this humble family, so like us in our poverty, could birth a Savior? And yet, as we looked around at the beauty of his mother and the trusting assurance of the quiet, loving father, we somehow felt it was for real, and it meant he'd come for us, for the meek and lowly and downtrodden, and we knelt and gave thanks. All humble people, yes, so far, but let's add some more to represent others of the world with wisdom, wealth, and scholarship. After all, they belong to the Savior, too. Chronologically, of course, the wise men don't belong at the manger. They came much later, after Mary and Joseph had moved to a house. Joseph had begun to do a bit of carpenter work until Mary and the baby could travel back to Nazareth. So the wise men really don't fit in here. But in another sense, they do belong. They're part of what the event means, which is really more important. So let's hear from them now. You're right. It did take us a long time to find the Christ child. Once we'd seen the new star, it took weeks to study out its meaning and to decide how to respond. Then we had to prepare for the trip, pulling most of our savings from the caravan and provisions. And don't forget the presents. They cost a good part of our modest fortunes, too. After all, they had to be worthy of a king, because that's what the star meant. But you know, the gifts really weren't proper for a king. I mean, the gold was, but not the others. No, I think we felt some kind of inner guidance in choosing those other two presents. No one would give them to a king. Hardly. Frankincense is for worship. That kind of powder you'd burn as part of worship to the finest deity. And myrrh, that's only used to anoint a body for burial. What a strange gift, almost an insult to a new baby king. How could we have known at that point that he was to die for all of our sins? But don't you think God was guiding you to the right gifts, just as he'd worked every other detail out perfectly the night Jesus was born? Oh yes, we're sure of it. The star was God's guiding, and the prophecy about Bethlehem came straight from God's written word. And then you guided us by a dream to avoid the, that fox, Herod. Yes, how wonderful the way our God reached out and touched each part of this event. It shows how very important it all was in his plan. So welcome, all of you from the Far East. Now as God planned it, the whole world is represented here. Take your places with the others around the manger. So now they're all here, lovely, accepting, trusting Mary, honest, faithful, dependable Joseph, the innkeeper's wife who cared to, enough to help, simple, eager shepherds longing for the Messiah, wise, wealthy astrologers from the East willing to give their all for a new king they knew only by a star. 
And I'm there, a constant reminder of God's intervention at each point of the story. Yes, it's a picture of the final chapter in God's way of salvation. Yes, everyone's here, except you good folks. We need you to complete the scene. For the good news I announced to the shepherds was for all people, men and women alike, young and old, rich and poor, sinner and saint. It's yours to share too. So come now and join us. Come with your gifts if you like, but more than that, come with yourselves. Stop and kneel for a time if you want. Meditate for a moment on what the good news means to you. Then take your light from his light and go out and tell someone else the good news. I announced it first, but you are God's messengers from now on. The Savior said, you are the light of the world. So come to his light, receive it, let it fill and nourish you. Then take it out, on, out with you into someone else's darkness as you leave. Yes, come, add your beauty to the scene or your weariness, or loneliness, or strength, or joy, or sadness. Add that special, unique something only you have to our living picture, Faces Around the Nature. Will you please join us in singing first and third verses of Silent Night? It can be found in your hymnal on page 184. suffering with a cold and a cough and what have you. I've tried every chord I can think of on this guitar. I just haven't seemed to hit it yet. So. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day walk the water did you know that your baby boy will save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you delivered soon deliver you. The deaf will hear, the dead will live again, the lame will leap, dumb will speak. Praises 
of the land, maybe did you know that your baby boy will get inside to a fine man? Did you know that your baby boy will <coughs> storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy Kiss the face of God, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again. The lame will lead, the dumb will speak. Praises of the land, maybe did you know that your baby born? Lord of all creation, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect land? This sleeping child you're holding. Is the great I am. Thank you. Well, cold or not, we appreciate it. Very much so. All right, now into the more serious part of our time here. It's time to pray. And obviously we want to thank Carol and Dave. Carol's having a time trying to stay healthy. Dave's having a time trying to stay healthy. And they're those two unhealthy people are trying to take care of each other. <laughs> so we're praying for Carol and Dave. And that's that's gonna be my request. I also I actually I got another one too. My boss has a daughter who had some very serious spinal surgery a while back. And you know, I saw the pictures, and it's literally crooked like a question mark. They pinned it all back together, and she's straighter now, and she lives a normal life, but they're going to go ahead, because she's having some pain, they're going to rework it again. Only this time, they're cutting tendons. Now, they tell me, he says, this is the way to go, because it'll straighten her right up. So, we want to pray for Madeline, is her name. Maddie, Maddie Grotenrath. And with that, what would you, what do you need prayer for? Anybody? Oh, who am I pointing at? Oh, I see, I, I see it. It's Gabriel. Speak up, sweetie. So they're having trouble paying bills at her house. So we need to pay for parents' employment. And I know that a lot of us don't really think about this, but believe me, kids, when you have trouble, your kids can tell. And it is definitely stressful for them too. So absolutely, we'll pray for your parents and money. Money, money, money. Who's up? Who else? My sister would have left me in the ditch. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Well, she looks pretty healthy. Her eyes are still open. Yeah. Did you say she was still on anesthetic right now? She probably doesn't even know you're talking. All right. Yeah, we'll pray for Julie to continue healing. 
All right, go ahead, Raven. There's nothing worse than waiting for something that already creates a little fear and then finding out you have to wait another two weeks. No, I, I'm not, I, I understand that. But the point is, do you want to get it over with or not? Yeah, see, so, so it just, e either way, whether you're fearful or not, it's still, you're just adding to the pile. So, yeah, we'll, we'll make sure we pray for that. Anyone else? Ginger? See another hand. Um, can you pray for my boss Bob? He was doing good, and then this past week he fell, and he was in that he went to hospital, and he had only like sixty percent of his blood again. Wow. And he's gonna have surgery in a couple weeks on his aorta. Oh, that's hard stuff. All right. Anybody else? Just so that we, we, so we know, I mean, a lot of you folks probably don't know some of the people that I might mention right now, but Pat and Ray, you know, they're, they're, they're homebound and it's Christmas time. And there's so many other, other people who we would normally see in here that aren't here, who either can't or for whatever reason aren't here. Would you please think of those faces when, when we're praying that you don't see? Uh, you know who you walk into every time you come in here. And whether you know their names or not, you certainly see their faces when you go, oh, that person's not here today, and that chair's empty, and that chair's empty. You know, Travis and Linda aren't here. And I'm not sure what the circumstance is, but it doesn't matter. We would still like to pray that, you know, the people that aren't here are still blessed in some way. So let's uh, just be mindful of that while we pray. So let's bow our heads and, and take these things to God. Lord, you have blessed us so much, more than we could possibly begin to even thank you for because we take so much for granted you blessed us in so many ways may you help us to see that Lord we acknowledge you as the greatest king of all kings and so before we we come and petition you for these things we just want to thank you one more time and as humbly as we can be to do so Lord we've got a mountain of things that are troublesome things that we're uncertain about, things we don't know what to do. Lord, we ask that you would continue to help Julie heal, that you would bless her, that you would draw her closer to you. For Carol and Dave, Lord, they've served so long and just been fervent warriors for you. So we pray that you would bless and comfort them in such a way today that would be so uplifting. For Maddie Grotenrath, Lord, we pray for her and that as she works through her back problems with her doctors and her parents that you would just give them guidance and the doctors the right steady hands to, to work it out so she's healthy and strong. For Bob and the surgery that's coming on his, on his heart and for the falls that he's taken, Lord, we just pray that you would help him heal, that you would bless him in such a way. Maybe we'll even meet him here someday. That would be awesome. For Tim, while his sister takes care of him and tries to nurse him to a, a better place, Lord, work in his life. Make him see. Lord, we lift Ann up to you and the surgery that she's going to have or would like to have. Lord, we pray that you bless her. Such a shining light here at our church all the time, trying to be positive when there's so much pain involved. So we ask that you would lift her up and give her strength. For Benita, Lord, we ask that you would find the liver that is necessary, that you would heal her, and that you would comfort her and, and draw her even closer to you through all of it. And Lord, for this family, you brought these people all here for a reason today, Lord. It's a family that you could have, only you could have assembled here this time, on this day, in this place. And so, Lord, everyone here is family. And I pray that you would sit with each and every person here 
hold them close. Draw them closer to you and let's not help us to help us to remember, Lord, the reason why we celebrate this great Christmas day that's coming. Because Easter is right around the corner, Lord. Thank you for sending your son. So we give this time to you, Lord, and ask that you would be blessed. And all God's people said, Amen. Okay, now you got to stand and we can sing. sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, 
How can the love of God be in that person? And our second reading is Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. preacher a lot of time. For, pardon? We still have a song to sing? Oh. Why didn't you sit? Why didn't you lead it? You're the one. season. And by the way, we should announce that Saturday night we will be having a Christmas Eve service. We will be serving communion. There will be some wonderful music. We will be lighting the real candles, except for the kids who get the little ones, uh, battery operated. I just want you to know that because this is all about Jesus and his love. Sunday morning, Christmas morning, many of you celebrate your Christmases as a family on, sun, sun, or on Christmas morning. Get up, do it, and come to church and worship with us. We have some special music, special, extra special music planned for that next week, and I think you'll enjoy the service. And once again, ever mindful as a quasi-Baptist will get you out in time to beat the rest to the restaurants. So uh, we'll do our, do our best for that. Now, God is love. 
That last scripture that Shelley read was chapter 9 of Isaiah, verse 6, which was a prophecy that God gave. And it says this, For unto us a child is born, a baby. We celebrate it with the little manger here. And that is one puny doll in there. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, we, we celebrate the birth of a child. That's insignificant. But the next phrase, unto us a son is given. God gave his son. That gives us, God gives us God. That's impressive. That's far more important than a baby being born on a, on a Saturday night. We don't know what time it was born. We know the stars were out and they followed the star. But the Son of God was given. And unto him was given many names. You know that throughout the Bible, more than 200 names are given for Christ. 200. How many of them can you think of? Jesus, of course. Christ, of course. What are some of the other names? Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. The Good Shepherd. Jehovah. Jehovah, okay, that is the Old Testament, one of the Old Testament names. What? How about that? The, pardon? Counselor. Counselor. The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. The Rose of Sharon. The Lily of the Valley the bread of life, the light of the world. All of those are names given for Christ. Over 200 of them if we wanted to list them. But it all comes down to what he is. God is love. Mike, I knew I had a clicker. I don't have a clicker. There it is. We want to talk about the holy days. These are God's days. And so I want you to it was read during our Christmas story. And I want you to go, uh, during the children's program, I want you to go to that passage that was referred to, that the opening was, and that is 1 Corinthians 13. God's days. Because God is love. What is love? Everybody wants to know what is love. Well, it's the gift. I used to say this very simply. God so loved that he gave. You want to describe love? You describe it with gifts. God so loved that he gave. A, a, a name for Christ that I would give it not necessarily biblical. Love is a giver. God is love. You always ask yourself, why do we go out for Christians? For Christians, those who want to honor God's days, we go out and buy presents. And we, we, we try to pick them proportionate to who we're giving to and maybe how much we love them. And, and, and give her. But what is love? So we describe it and God described it. And here's what he said. In 1 Corinthians 13, uh, I think it was one of the readers, Gabriel was saying this in the play, I speak the tongues of men and angels, but I don't have love. I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have faith that can move mountains but don't have love, I'm nothing. And then he describes it. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, and it rejoices in the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. Always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. And if you read that right there with me, you would say, that we could, every place before a description, we could say, God is love, because he is. God is kind, 
because he is. God does not envy. It, God does not boast. We could all the way through there. But I want you to reread that with me. Jesus days. God's a love that he gave. And read that letter from the apostle this way. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not Jesus, I'm nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not Jesus, I gain nothing. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. Jesus does not boast. Jesus is not proud, nor is Jesus rude. Jesus is not self-seeking. Jesus is not easily angered. Jesus keeps no records of wrongs. Jesus does not delight in evil in a, even a little bit. Jesus rejoices with the truth. Jesus always protects. Jesus always trusts. Jesus always hopes. And he always perseveres. Hmm. That puts a different slant on 1 Corinthians 13, doesn't it? I use that often in, in, in counseling and almost every wedding that I uh, officiate at. I use 1 Corinthians 13, love, and say, you got, if you're going to love, if you're going to be happily married, you have to be 1 Corinthians 13. Love is kind and it's always patient. Ooh, well, it's, it, the King James got it right. Love suffers long. <laughs> and then it follows it up. Love is always kind even when you're suffering. But what about our days? What about our days? This time, I want you to follow me closely and put your name here. Love Larry, your name is patient. Love, Larry, your name is kind. Your name, my name, does not envy. Again, your name, my name, does not boast. My name, your name, is not proud. is not rude. Your name, my name, is not self-seeking. Another way, narcissistic. Your name, my name, is not easily angered. Your name, my name, keeps no records of wrong. That's a tough one, folks. Can you put your name there? Your name or mine does not delight in evil. And your name or mine rejoices in the truth. Your name or mine always protects. Always trusts. Your name or mine always hopes. And it always perseveres. There's a story about a man named Doug, Doug Nichols. He went to, mission, to India to be a missionary. But while he was just starting to study the language, he became very infected with tuberculosis and had to be put into a sanitarium. It was not a very good place to be. It was not very clean, and the conditions were difficult because there were so many sick people there. He decided to do the best he could with the situation, so he took a bunch of Christian books and tracts and tried to witness to the others in the sanitarium, to the other patients. And, but when he tried to pass out the tracts because of the language differences, they were rejected. Nobody wanted them. He tried to hand out Bibles, 
no one would take them. He tried to witness, but because he was handicapped, because of his inability to, inability to communicate with their language, he felt so discouraged. And here he was, a missionary, but because of his illness, he would be, and he would be there a long time. It seemed that it, it seemed like the work that he had been sent to do would never get done, because no one would listen to him. Because of his tuberculosis, every night about two o'clock he would wake up with a chronic coughing, and and he just couldn't quit, and he couldn't sleep. But one night he awoke. He noticed across the aisle a man trying to get, out, get up out of bed, an older man. He said the man would roll himself, himself up into a little ball and, and teeter back and forth, trying to get up the momentum to get up and stand on his feet, but he just couldn't do it. He was too weak. Finally, after several attempts, the old man would lay back and cry. The next morning... Doug understood why he was weeping. He was trying to get up to go to the bathroom. He didn't have enough strength to do that, so his bed was a mess and there was this awful smell in the air. And The other patients made fun of him, in fact, and that only ensued and his, encouraged his embarrassment. The nurses came to clean up his bed, and they, they weren't very kind to him either. Even one of them, one of them even slammed him and slapped him in the face, and Doug said the old man just laid there and cried. The next night, about two o'clock, Doug started coughing again. Couldn't sleep. He looked across the way, and there was the old man trying to get, get up out of bed once more. I really didn't want to do it, he says, but somehow I managed to get up and walk across the aisle, and I helped the old man stand up. But he was too weak to walk. So Doug says, I took him in my arms and carried him like a baby. He was so light that it really wasn't a difficult task. I took him into the bathroom, which was nothing more than a dirty hole in the floor. I stood behind him and cradled him in my arms as he took care of himself. Then I carried him back to his bed and laid him down. As I, turned, as, as I turned to leave, he reached up and grabbed my face, pulled me close and kissed me on the cheek and said, thank you. The next morning, there were patients waiting when I awoke and they asked if they could read some of the books and tracts that I had brought. Others had questions about the God I worshipped and his only begotten son that came into the world for their sins. Doug Nichols says that in the next few weeks, he gave out all the literature he had brought, and many of the doctors and nurses and patients in that sanatorium came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. He said, now what do we do? He said, I didn't preach a sermon. I couldn't even communicate in their language. I didn't teach a great lesson. I didn't have wonderful things to offer. All I did was take an old man to the bathroom. Anybody can do that. Now reread, if you will, 1 Corinthians 13 with your name. Is it true? 1 John 4, 7 to 12 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. And it does, because God is love, and he sent his Son, who is love. Whosoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. So now when you read 1 Corinthians 13, there's a song that says, Love was when God became a man, just a carpenter with some fishermen. Or the fishermen. Love, Larry, Marilyn, Tim, Jake, love suffers long, but love is kind. Love gives. This is the day to accept 
God's love and live it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you that this exciting, busy, enthusiastic Sunday is your day. But you made it to be our day because you, Lord, love and gave us your Son. Now let us love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. To stand as we sing our closing song, whatever that might be.